So today I'm going to give you a, a real quick overview of some of the progress we've made with NASA's first satellite designed to make measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, with the kind of precision uh, and, and sampling needed to actually look for its sources and sinks. The satellite is the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, and as we go through the presentation, you'll get a little bit more understanding and, and background into that satellite. But before we get there, we're going to start with just a little bit of an overview of the carbon cycle and the problems that we're facing today, uh, the issues we're trying to track with satellites. By the time we get through that discussion, you should understand why we need satellites as well as ground-based measurements, like people like Heather are making, um, to, to make them to actually start to understand this problem and, and to uh, start to understand how to manage it a little bit better. Then we'll talk a little bit about some of the very early results from uh, OCO2. We've only been delivering data to the public now uh, since the beginning of this month, so uh, it's, uh, this is all brand new for us. Okay, human activities. Uh, you all know uh, that we burn fossil fuels for just about everything, including running the air conditioning and heating in the building here. Uh, every time we light a fire, every time we start a car, uh, we, we basically are burning fossil fuels most, for the most part for most of that energy these days. That these days is actually adding about 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide to our atmosphere every year. That's about five and a half tons of carbon dioxide for every man, woman, and child on Earth. That's your, that's your average. Now, as an American, uh, we, uh, we, we always have to overachieve, and so the average American actually releases about 16 tons of carbon dioxide into the air every year. Uh, but once again, the, the world global average is, is about 5.5 tons per person. That's a lot of CO2. How much CO2 is 40 billion tons? If you can do the math, CO2 is, is 400 parts per million in the atmosphere these days. Uh, if you look at the total mass of CO2 in the atmosphere, do this little calculation and you find out that 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide is enough to increase the carbon dioxide abundance of our atmosphere by 1% per year. My generation always said we wanted to change the world. We did. Okay, let's show you how. That's part of the story. Now, fossil fuel emitters. Uh, we've known for a long time the U.S. has been the leading individual country for emitting fossil fuels uh, into the atmosphere. This is how many billions of tons of carbon dioxide uh, emitted into the atmosphere by country. And so up until fairly recently, we were leading the world. Uh, basically, uh, you can see very, uh, very recently we've been coming down a little bit with our fossil fuel emissions. But that's primarily because we've been switching from coal to natural gas. We haven't really been reducing the amount of, of fossil fuels we're burning per se or the number of, of, of gigawatts of energy we're generating with fossil fuels. We've just changed the source and reduced it that way. Europe has been coming down for a number of years, since actually about the mid-1970s. A lot of that is Sweden, but the rest of Europe basically has also been kind of going pretty well here in terms of its, its use. But then look at these two curves. This, this is the developing world. This is China. Now, when I, back, back when we started this mission called the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, China was kind of, a, a, kind of a, a following everybody else in its fossil fuel emissions. It was coming up slowly, nothing very, nothing very uh, scary at the time. But uh, just soon after we got into this process, China started increasing its fossil fuel consumption substantially, sub releasing substantial amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, to, so, to the point where, uh, actually this year, up here, it's actually uh, releasing more than twice as much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year than the USA. That's pretty amazing. So once again, the, and we're seeing a big shift here. Uh, one of the shifts is, once again, that, that um, we're putting a lot in the air. A lot, most of it now turns out to be coming from, from uh, the U.S. and China, the two big leaders. Uh, the most rapid growth these days, though, if you look at the actual rate of growth, is coming from the developing world. That actually introduces some very interesting new challenges for us because in the past, when I started in this business, uh, kind of over in this time frame, Fossil fuel emissions of carbon dioxide were one of the best understood sources of carbon dioxide on the planet. We understood them better than anything else. But as China, in particular, has increased its fossil fuel emissions so fast, even they, under their best, in their best efforts, cannot track the amount of carbon dioxide they're producing, the amount of fossil fuel they're burning. They don't know. So there's substantial amounts of uncertainty going into this as time goes on. So now, human emissions of carbon dioxide is in, are in fact the most uncertain 
area of, of carbon dioxide emissions into our atmosphere. Okay? So it's become a very interesting problem. It's kind of shifted a little bit over time. We've changed gears here, uh, and, and now we've gone from the developing world, uh, basically leading the effort, uh, are the, are the uh, emissions. Uh, I can't, I, we can't really hold this against them. They actually want the, uh, the standard of living that we have. Uh, if I, I had a, I don't believe I have in this package the slide that shows per capita uh, emissions of carbon dioxide, but a very interesting thing happened in 2012. The per capita emissions in China matched and then surpassed the per capita emissions in Europe. Per capita. Think about that. But what are they doing? Is that, have they really been able to increase their standard of living to the level that we have here in, in Europe? I would say no. In fact, what they're doing is producing a lot of stuff for us. They, they probably built this. Uh, so in any case, they're basically producing a lot of stuff for us, and they're actually leading the world in emissions right now. We can't hold that against them. But they're really not the big players, and we're not the big players as human, in the human, as human beings in the natural carbon cycle. The oceans actually emit a lot more carbon dioxide than we do. The oceans actually emit 330 billion tons, uh, about um, uh, eight times as much carbon dioxide into the air every year uh, as all human activities combined. But then the oceans, well, they, they work a little over time, and they actually reabsorb about 340 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year. So they actually absorb more carbon dioxide than they emit. The land biosphere, now this is the real champion of the world, 440 billion tons of carbon dioxide, more than 10 times as much carbon dioxide as humans emit into the air every year. Trees and plants and the soils emit into the air every year. But then they reabsorb more than they emit. Okay? Very interesting thing. These are the big guys. This is the 300 pound gorilla in the room uh, that you can't really ignore. Uh, and, and this is actually emitting more, but then reabsorbing more CO2 than human activities. It's a very interesting process. Now, how do we know all of that? We know all of that because people have been making measurements of carbon dioxide from a very large number of sites around the world. One more time, I have to move this out of my way. Starting from Mauna Loa Observatory, uh, and then other sites coming in in different parts of the world, making measurements. This is since 1979. And each one of these points, this is the South Pole, the North Pole. Each one of these points is a station. That's Mauna Loa Observatory. And as you can see, you can actually watch the Earth breathe. This is the Northern Hemisphere land plants basically bringing CO2 out in spring and summer, bringing it, pushing, putting it back in, in in fall and winter. So spring, summer, fall, winter. Spring, summer, fall, winter. See how that works? And notice that if you look at the southern hemisphere, it's kind of anti-correlated with the northern hemisphere. It goes down when the northern hemisphere goes up and so forth. Isn't that neat? This is from our ground-based measurements. And this is telling us a tremendous amount about the system. But what it's also showing us is that the total amount in the atmosphere just keeps going up and up and up. And in May of 2013, for the first time, Mauna Loa hit 400 parts per million in, on the, in mid-May uh, in 2013. Now, it turns out that the CO2 has continued to go up. Uh, this is the Keeling curve going up and to the right here. Um, and uh, it basically records all of those cycles every year. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, but that's okay. I have to stay away from that screen. It's touchy. Uh, but once again, it watches the carbon dioxide go up and down and so forth. But uh, it's continuing to go up, and it's gone up now uh, such that Mauna Loa did not hit 400 parts per million in May. In fact, it hit it in May in 2013, it hit it in March in 2014, and it hit it in February in 2015. It's quite a bit above 400 parts per million right now. So I, I haven't looked, Heather. Did you look at the, C, the ESRL page today or something and see what it was? It's about 408, or 408 409, something like that. Okay. It's, if somebody asks what the, uh, the CO2 amount in the atmosphere is going to be in about 2020, I usually just say, uh, assume two parts per million per year. <laughs> That's about where we're going these days. In any case, this has taught us a lot about the carbon system, but what it hasn't told us is where the carbon is coming from in detail, or what processes are absorbing carbon dioxide in our system, and where they're located. So we don't know where the sources are, we don't know where the sinks are from this network. And part of the reasons is, as this network has grown, notice it's grown, there's a lot of stations over North America, a lot of stations over Europe, almost none in South America, none in Africa, very, very th few through most of Asia. The, the, the Arctic is also very, very 
lightly populated with stations as well. Certain heroic people go there and make crazy measurements, and, and that's, that's critical. But once again, we, just haven't, we don't really have the measurement base to make this make these measurements. Now what I've just described is, is actually only half the, the, the puzzle here. Uh, I mentioned that we're putting fossil fuels into the air, 40 billion tons a year from human activities alone. This is the actual fossil fuel emissions over time. And look, notice this, tra this traces out uh, recessions, it traces out fuel crises, it traces out, this is the recent recession, 2008, and now we're really coming up again. It, basically, you're seeing a significant amount of variation in the fossil fuel emissions of CO2 uh, associated with economics. You know? So once again, this is the, the population of the world growing. This is the economic conditions of the world improving over time. But that's half of the story. The other half is this curve down here. This is actually the, the amount of CO2 that's staying in the atmosphere. So if you take the measurements from that series of stations I just showed you and you integrate them over year, year to year and you actually say how many tons of CO2 stayed in the atmosphere, that's this blue curve. Now the first thing you notice is the blue curve is only about half as high as the black curve. Only half of the carbon dioxide that human activities put into the atmosphere every year stays there. Slightly less than half it turns out. The rest is absorbed somewhere in the land biosphere, somewhere in the oceans. We know that a quarter of all of the CO2 we emit ends up in the ocean. How do we know that? As it does that, it makes the ocean more acidic. You go out and make measurements. You find out that the ocean is more acidic now than it was last year and the year before and the year before. That's called ocean acidification. It's a major issue. Okay? The other quarter we think has to be going somewhere on land, but the amounts are so large, you're looking for a giant rainforest every year coming into existence that wasn't there before. Has anybody seen that pop out of existence somewhere? I, we're looking for it. If you happen to find it, let me know. We don't see it. Okay, so there's a lot of mystery. Some people think it's the, the Amazon that's absorbing the CO2. Some people think it's the, the boreal systems and the, and the tundra and the longer growing season up there that's making contributions. Others seem to th think that, based on the existing data, that mid-latitude forests are absorbing this carbon dioxide. But we can't find it. Okay? That's where we are today. We learn more and more every year. Science or Nature publishes an article every six months saying, it's here! And then, it, no, 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 it's here! N no, it's here. It's, it's, it, we don't know. That's where we are today. Okay? So, bottom line. From all of this, the other thing that's about this I'll point out is notice how smooth, relatively smooth this curve is over time. Notice how jagged this curve is. Some years, almost all of the carbon dioxide we put into the system stays there. Other years, even just a couple of years later, almost none. Any ideas why that is? By the way, write it up if you, if you figure it out. It's, it's good for, uh, it would be a very, very easily accepted paper. We don't know. Okay? So the bottom line is the processes that are controlling the amount of CO2 that stays in the atmosphere from year to year are also virtually unknown. They want me to predict the amount of CO2 that's going to be in the atmosphere in 2050 based on some scenario of emissions. I can't predict how much is going to stay in the atmosphere next year. That's where we are today. Okay? These are some of the things we have to do. Yes? And how would you think you estimate how much is in the atmosphere right now? We know the amount in the atmosphere right now probably to about the width of that line. That's one of the most precise things we know. With the 100 and plus stations we have around the world and the fact that the carbon dioxide everywhere on the planet varies by only a couple of percent we basically have a very good measure of the total amount that's being put into the atmosphere every year. Uh, we actually know that probably better than we know the fossil fuel emissions these days. Yeah. Okay? So, we know that natural processes, photosynthesis, plants absorb carbon dioxide to grow. Every molecule of carbon in a plant, which is mostly carbon, comes from the air. Okay, we've known that since grade school. Also, water absorbs into, into the, or, or uh, CO2 absorbs into seawater. Mainly if the water is cold. You know, you take that beer out of the refrigerator and it's nice and fizzy, you pop the top. That's CO2 in the water. 
leave it out on the table for a little while and it warms up and it goes flat. The CO2 all goes into the air. So once again, we know that, that solubility changes with temperature and we also know that the oceans are warming up. How is that going to affect the system? Any ideas? Once again, write it up. Human emissions of carbon dioxide have now become a significant part of this total system. It's only 1 20th of the combination of the emissions by the land biosphere and the oceans. But you know, if I have a slow drip in a faucet into a sink with the stopper in, it still fills up over time, unless you pull the stopper out, right? So that's what's happening now. We're basically filling the system up with carbon dioxide as, uh, with, with increasing time as we burn fossil fuels. And also other land use practices and so forth also cause CO2 to build up. To actually predict the buildup over time, we actually have to know, though, not just what we're doing. We have to know how the system's going to respond to what we're doing. That's the critical thing that needs to be done next. Okay? This is easier to predict or even change than that. You can't, probably cannot control the system. Okay? That's where we are today. Or I should say, not on purpose. So you have to wonder, you know, if, why is this so hard? What's the big deal? Well, this is what. Well, this is why it's so hard. We can actually use measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide as a very strong constraint on where it's being emitted and where it's being absorbed. We can't go out and measure every blade of grass and every tree, but you just measure the CO2 in the atmosphere. But the problem is, is carbon dioxide is emitted into atmosphere either by human activities or forest or by, by biomass burning and, and fires. It gets spread around by the winds in a very complicated fashion. This looks like weather, right? This is a simulation of carbon dioxide done by our friends at, you know, on the GS5 team, uh, Leslie Lott, Ott and her, her uh, team members uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center. And it's a very nice high resolution movie of, of what they think carbon dioxide might look like in our atmosphere uh, if you actually uh, put it into a, uh, a very, very sophisticated uh, transport model. And, and so we see China over here generating a lot of carbon dioxide. We see, because they, that's what they told the model, they were seeing it coming off the north, northeast coast of the U.S. Now this is, this is 2006, a simulation for the year 2006, and this is still March, and it's going through one day at a time here, uh, going through March. As we go through this a little longer, and as you stare at this for a few more minutes, what you'll see is as the northern hemisphere biosphere starts to wake up and starts to bloom in the spring, you're gonna start seeing all of this red up here turn blue like it is down here. Now, by the way, blue here is low CO2, red is high CO2, and the, the maximum difference you see between the reddest red here and the bluest blue here turns out being 2%. Only 2%. That's how much all of these processes are affecting the average column integrated CO2 amount in the atmosphere. 2%. That's all you get. Why is that? Well, because there's 400 parts, of, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere already, and we're dumping in about enough to make another four parts per million this year. Somewhere about two parts per million of that is disappearing somewhere. Okay? Get all the math right? It's, you know. But as you can see now, oh, here we go. Northern Hemisphere has finally woken up, and the biosphere is now very strongly pulling the CO2 out of the system. And, and absorbing all of that. And as we get into the spring and summer, you'll see some really nice anomalies over like the Corn Belt, over Western Europe, and over China, as the system really pulls the CO2 out very, very strongly. See how that works? Now, if we could just monitor this at high enough resolution to capture some of that structure, that time-dependent structure, we would probably be able to trace this back to find the sources of carbon dioxide. But if we have only 100 plus stations around the world making super precise measurements, whereas they can tell you the bulk amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere very accurately, can they tell you where it's coming from or going to? Not so well. Predicting where the carbon dioxide is coming from and going to with only about 100 ground-based stations would be like trying to predict the weather with only a hundred weather stations. We had that many in the 19th century. How well did we predict the weather back then? Any ideas? Not so well. Now, how did we revolutionize me measurements of weather? First of all, we, we made thousands of ground-based weather stations. We had balloons. 
We don't have that yet for carbon dioxide or any other greenhouse gas. But we then, in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, we started launching spacecraft that could make millions of measurements of weather every day. Okay? So one way we can actually start to use the information in this atmospheric field to look for sources and sinks is to launch satellites that can make millions of measurements a day. That's where we need to be going into the future. But that's not so easy either because, as I mentioned, the largest differences you're seeing here are only a couple of percent. Typical differences we're seeing, say, between North America and the Mid-Atlantic over here are one-tenth that big, two-tenths of one percent. So we're talking about making measurements of a gas that you cannot see with your eyes to an accuracy of two-tenths of one percent from space. That's hard. Never been done before. Okay? So that's one of the reasons that we've been working at this. But once again, there are good ideas out there. Um, we found, after a lot of work, I won't go through the, the detailed evolution of this, but we found that by actually measuring reflected sunlight with high-resolution spectrometers, we can actually learn about carbon dioxide because as sunlight passes through the atmosphere, bounces off the surface, and goes back up to the satellite, uh, as it runs into carbon dioxide molecules here, it basically uh, absorbs some light from the, carbon from the sunlight. The carbon dioxide molecules, like oxygen molecules, like water molecules, every other molecule in the atmosphere, only absorb certain colors of light. So if you look in those spectral ranges, or those ranges of color that are absorbed by carbon dioxide and oxygen and other gases. You can actually then look at the little dark lines and the darkness of those lines basically tells you how many photons are absorbed in each of those lines. It tells you more or less how many molecules you ran into along that path. So you can literally count the molecules from the sun to the surface to the satellite. Okay? And you get nice spectra that look like this. Uh, this is the oxygen A band. These are two CO2 bands here. Why oxygen? Uh, well, if you just measure the amount of carbon dioxide molecules, you won't know exactly unless you know exactly where you're pointing, which is not super easy with a spacecraft. Uh, you won't ac actually know how long the path is necessarily. You won't know how much, what the surface pressure is, how many molecules of air there are there. And one could just have a shorter path and think that you have less CO2. A longer path, more CO2. You look over a valley, you see a lot of CO2. You look over a mountain, you see a little bit of CO2. Turns out that's not very useful information. What you want to know is the ratio of, of, of uh, CO2 to dry air, okay? So you measure a concentration. Because if I see a higher concentration CO, of CO2 here, a lower concentration of CO2 here, something's putting it in here. Something's taking it out there relative to oxygen or nitrogen, okay? So we're going to actually use oxygen as a proxy and measure CO2 relative to that. Now, because we, from space, we actually don't measure carbon dioxide, we measure spectra. We then have to run this through, that didn't work, okay. Run this through a, uh, something called a retrieval algorithm. I'll talk about that in a little bit more, which basically takes the information and, and models it, comes up with a, 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 a better estimate from the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we go through this process and we generate estimates of something called the column average CO2 dry air mole fraction. That's the quantity we actually measure from space. So it's, the, it's an average concentration over a column of air. It's not really a vertical column of air. It's the column that goes from the sun to the surface to the spacecraft. Okay? That's what we get to measure from space. Now, because we're trying to make a measurement to some, with, with incredible accuracy, really unprecedented accuracy for a space-based measurement, the next thing you have to do is to validate that measurement against absolutely every standard on the planet. So including flask measurements where you basically take a can, fill it full of air, send it to uh, ESRL in Boulder, Colorado. They analyze the data using incredibly sophisticated methods. We've also, uh, you get similar measurements from towers these days, uh, tall towers. We have a very interesting new device called an air core, which is a very long tube that's wound up into a, a roll. We put it on a weather balloon, we fly it up. One end of the tube is open, the other end is closed. The air goes out of the tube as it goes up to very high altitude, and then we drop it. When it goes down through the atmosphere and the air goes back into this very narrow capillary tube as the, as the system falls, and it gives you a profile of, of air all the way down to the track. And we can analyze that and pull CO2 profiles out. 
We also have up-looking Fourier transform spectrometers, great big laboratory scale instruments that look up through, we put them in shipping containers, put telescope domes on the top of them, they look right at the sun. They make incredibly precise measurements of carbon dioxide through the system. We can validate the space-based measurements against all of these classes of measurements. Then in addition, if there are other satellites up there, you can compare your observations of theirs to see if in fact they, they look similar. We've been doing all of that for the last few years. Now, the real pioneer in this field is a, is a European satellite called uh, Invisat. had an instrument on it called Skiamaki. They took some of the very first solar reflected measurements of carbon dioxide uh, from 2002 through 2012. Uh, it measured methane as well as carbon dioxide. It could produce seasonal scale maps on, on, uh, on uh, uh, regional scale maps on uh, annual cycles, but it really took a lot of data. The instrument wasn't very sensitive, and then to get even looking, looking for any of these small variations, you had to integrate for a very long time. So it had some limitations, had a large footprint, almost always had a cloud somewhere in the footprint, which kind of made, which added bias to the measurement. So it wasn't the ideal measurement, but we learned a lot from that, that experience. Right now, we had GOSAT up there for the last six years. Uh, this is a Japanese satellite that, that makes measurements at much higher spectral resolution uh, than, than Skiamaki did, and they're much more sensitive, but it still has some, some limitations. It can only look at a very narrow range of, of uh, uh, this is a little map of the world here. This is North America and, and, and Europe over here, and this is the ocean here, and you can see a narrow band of, of measurements of carbon dioxide over the ocean. It couldn't, it didn't have, wasn't sensitive enough to measure CO2 over the ocean except over a narrow band. And it couldn't actually look uh, very far away from the subsolar latitude with its scan mechanism on the satellite. It was a nadir pointing satellite and it could only look a little bit left and right of the track. So you're limited on the amount of sounding you get. And you only get about 350 soundings every day out of the satellite on average uh, over the year. So the next step uh, is a satellite called the Orbiting Carbon Observatory. There's a long history to the satellite. It goes back to 2000. It actually predates the other two satellites. But uh, we, we had a little trouble with it. Uh, for those of you who know the history, uh, we uh, actually tried to launch it back in 2009 after a long gestation period, and our rocket failed. Uh, and so the mission lasted a whole 10 minutes, and we ended up dropping the system into the, uh, the ocean. Uh, and so we had to rebuild it, and now it's OCO2. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about this satellite, which we've launched last July. So let's look, take a look at what it, in, in it uh, encompasses. It includes a single instrument, a, a spectrometer, that you're going to see a little bit more about in just a moment, uh, that makes very sensitive measurements. The instrument is integrated in the top half of a small satellite bus. The satellite's only about this tall and about this big around, about the size of two 55-gallon drums stacked on top of each other. We got a dedicated launch vehicle. In fact, this launch vehicle was so big that they could have back, take, taken one lap around the moon and brought it back and put it into orbit. In fact, the very same launch vehicle was used to put a spacecraft on the North Pole of Mars a few years ago. But it was the most reliable launch vehicle in the fleet, and NASA gave us that to launch the satellite. We took, then took about a month to fly up into the afternoon constellation, a constellation of satellites that make me measurements of the Earth. Uh, and so in August, uh, we launched in uh, July of last year, the 2nd of July, and in August, we were in the A-train. We then um, downlinked the data to a, an Alaska ground station, uh, and then we send it to initially Goddard, then JPL, where we actually do the product uh, analysis. So this is basically a, an overview of the OCO2 mission uh, and how we're actually implementing things. It all started on July 2nd with an absolutely perfect ride into space uh, on a Delta II launch vehicle from Vandenberg Air Force Base. And if you went to the launch, you wouldn't have seen anything except on a monitor because it was so cloudy and hazy because that's what we have in the summertime in California. It's called low, low clouds and fog. Uh, but if you were in Santa Cruz a few miles north, it was a beautiful launch coming out of the cloud tops. <laughs> and then zooming across the sky. Jeff Sullivan, a professional photographer and an amateur astronomer, took these pictures. They're just gorgeous. Uh, just under an hour after launch, uh, we were able to, there was a camera on the uh, launch vehicle, uh, and we were able to actually watch the spacecraft detach from the launch vehicle and, and fly off on its own. Solar panels opened a few minutes later, and we were power positive. Everything was good. We had a working spacecraft. And then it took about a month to move. We have four little thrusters on the back of the spacecraft, about as big as your pinky. It took us about a month to move from the parking orbit where the, where the uh, rocket put us uh, up into the A-train and sync up with a set of satellites flying around the Earth at 7 kilometers per second. That's quite a challenge, uh, but we got in there by August 3rd. We then cooled the instrument down, started taking data, and we've been taking data ever since. So 
Uh, let's look a little, learn a little bit more about the instrument that we're using. It's a three-channel grading spectrometer. Basically, it's just three spectrometers stuck together. They're all, they all look about the same. We have a common entry telescope. The light then goes into a set of beam splitters, goes into a set of relay optics down to a thin slit, and you'll see the rest of it in just a moment. But as you can see, there are three different channels. The, uh, uh, a channel for uh, measuring uh, carbon dioxide near two microns, which is about four times the wavelength range your eye is peaked at. Uh, 1.61 1, 1 microns and 1 at 0.76 microns for oxygen. Okay, it's the basic configuration of the instrument. The optical path for the instrument is not very different than something you've probably seen in your second year of physics. Very simple grading spectrometer. You have light coming in from a telescope. It goes through a narrow slit. It goes through a collimator. It hits a plane grading. Comes off of it. Comes into a little camera and gets uh, imaged onto a two-dimensional imaging sensor. Simple stuff, right? And it takes spectra that look like for the oxygen A band, a high resolution spectrum of the oxygen A band, the 1.61 micron CO2 band, the 2.06 micron CO2 band. Now what you can't see looking at this picture of this relatively simple instrument design is that this is one of the most difficult instruments that we've ever built. We made it so optically fast, in other words, we made the lenses so large in the system and the, the throughput of the system so high using uh, components that I learned how to build when I helped build the main camera in the Hubble Space Telescope called the Whitefield Planetary Camera 2. This thing, I, I, have a, I came from astronomy, and I have a tremendous respect for photons. <laughs> and so we made sure we used every one of them to their absolute utmost. And we needed to do that because we were going to make spectra here at super high spectral resolution. The resolving power of the spectrometer is 20,000, uh, which is about as high as any instrument, high resolution as we've ever flown, because I want very high contrast between those narrow lines uh, from carbon dioxide or oxygen and, and the surrounding continuum. So that gives me greater sensitivity to CO2. Okay? The challenge with this telescope, when you make it so optically fast, if any of you are photographers, you know that an f1.4 lens is a lot harder to make than an, an f2 or an f8 lens is. Uh, this is working at f1.8. Uh, and basically, it has uh, very, very small optical tolerances. The largest optical tolerance in the system is the focus tolerance for the detector. And the depth of field for this system, that tolerance, is 25 microns. It's the width of a human hair. If you go 25 microns out of that position, it's out of focus. But we had to build that not into a spectrometer that's sitting on a desktop here that I can go and tweak the knobs on and refocus. This is a spectrometer we had to build once and for all, hands off, put it on a rocket, launch it into space, and, and make it operate there. This was not an easy instrument to build. And we've built three of them now. We built one for OCO. We dropped that one in the ocean. We'll call that our engineering model. Then we built this one. We built a flight spare for this. We'll go, that, that will be launched on space station in 2018. So, uh, and every time it's happened, I have 20 engineers standing at my door saying, "What were you thinking?" <laughs> in any case, it works amazingly well. Now, the way we actually operate this this uh, spacecraft is we fly around the Earth, we orbit the Earth once every 100 minutes. So we get 14.5 orbits around the Earth every day, and we orbit from the south to the north as the Earth turns under us. We're in a sun-synchronous orbit at 1.30 in the afternoon. So we're basically, you can imagine if you're the sun and I'm the spacecraft, I'm going around in an orbit, and the Earth is turning underneath us, right? So I see the entire Earth always at 1.30 in the afternoon. That's called a sun-synchronous orbit. Another sun-synchronous orbit satellite right behind us is called uh, Aqua, and it carries an instrument called MODIS on it, which is a wide swath imager, and it makes beautiful images of things like clouds and sur surface uh, uh, properties and so forth. And we actually use that to find out, uh, uh, to check our algorithms to see whether or not we can figure out we're in a cloudy sky or not. We can't use cloudy spectra for CO2. So this just shows a, a day's coverage of, of MODIS, uh, with the picture, and the blue line through it is the very narrow swath that we make a measurement of for OCO. When OCO flies over, it only measures uh, a, a swath that's about eight tenths of a degree wide, which is about as wide as your pinky held at arm's length. Okay? That's how wide our swath is. So over that swath, I, I didn't emphasize it in the previous uh, slide, but uh, there are eight cross-track footprints across the swath, so there are actually eight independent pieces of information across the swath. The bottom footprint here is bright because we hit a cloud, but the ones right next to it are cloud-free, and we were able to get good CO2 measurements from those. Okay? So with this instrument, we actually collect data three times a second. We collect a, a, a full eight samples here of uh, spectra. There are 1024 elements in the spectrum going this way, but there are only eight across. 
Uh, so we collect that three times a second. We actually collect a million measurements a day with the satellite as we're flying over the Earth. Because of those clouds you see in that picture, though, uh, only about uh, maybe 20% of those are cloud-free enough to see all the way down to the ground. And most of that's happening in the, in the subtropics here with very, very le many, many fewer useful samples at high latitudes. And so we had to make a lot of measurements so that at least sometimes we get some samples in these cloudy regions. So we have to work really hard for that. Uh, oh, also, uh, this just shows the swath going across the Strait of Gibraltar. You, you know where that is, right? It's English. Okay, uh, but you can see the swath going across, uh, and you can see the width of the swath on the Strait of Gibraltar. It's a very narrow swath. This is not a mapping instrument, it's a sampling instrument. What we're trying to do is not map the ground, but map the atmosphere, and it moves anyway. So we just set, run a sample. So we take an oxygen A band spectrum, a 1.61 micron CO2 band spectrum, and a 2.06 micron CO2 band spectrum three times a second as we're flying over the Earth with this instrument. This takes a lot of data. All of it we have to analyze. So we started out just trying to calibrate the thing. And one of the things we had to do first was to figure out where it's pointing. The star tracker is pointing over our shoulder. The instrument's pointing fo forward. We need to line them up very accurately because if, if it's something that's more than an eight-tenths eight of a degree out of, out, of sounding, out of the field of view, we miss it. So the first thing we shot at was the moon, and we hit it first try. The, uh, the company that built the spacecraft, Orbital Sciences, says, well, we'll line things up to about a degree. So we figured on one orbit, we'd try to miss the moon on one side. The moon moves about once its width in every 100 minutes. So then the next orbit, it was supposed to actually be in the right place. And the third orbit, it was supposed to be um, uh, on the other side. And it turns out they were only 150 arc seconds off, or they were 20 times better than they said they were. So that, that was a good start. Good start. We then had to make sure that we also not only have to know where we're pointing relative to the star tracker, we have to know where, we're, where we are in the orbit to know where we're actually pointing. So we use coastlines and things like that to see if we're actually pointing where we think we are. It took a little time to get the results this good, but we finally got that down. So we actually know where we're pointing with the system. That's called geometric calibration. Next thing we had to do was to determine how the detectors are sensitive, how sensitive the detectors are to light, what their bias is, what their gain is. We measured this to extreme levels on the ground, but things change over time. So we had to actually, it goes up into space, and we had to recalibrate this in space. And we finally got that in pretty good shape right now, but that's still a, this is an ongoing battle that the team is fighting this week. I had 26 emails on my email thing this morning about a little problem with that area. Spectroscopic calibration, dispersion. What you're seeing here is an individual solar line. We can put a, a diffuser in place and look straight at the sun with this instrument. And the sun has a bunch of Fraunhofer lines in it, and we use those to actually assess the, the spectroscopic performance of the system. And this is just a, it's actually a pair of solar lines, you see. But it looks kind of blurry, right? There's a whole bunch of different lines there. That's because I put the diffuser in place, and I'm looking at the sun as I'm flying along the south pole of the Earth, and then I'm going all the way around the orbit, continually looking at the sun directly at the sun. So I'm going seven kilometers per second toward the sun when I'm coming around the southern hemisphere, seven kilometers per second away from the sun. Those are Doppler shifts that you're seeing. And when you correct for the Doppler shift, they all fall together, and you have a very nicely resolved spectral line that you can go and compare to your laboratory measurements. So far, we've had very good luck with our spectroscopic calibration. It's looking gorgeous and producing great spectra. The instrument's operating very well. I, I, I have to pull my punches when I say that this week. Actually, right now, the instrument is off. Every now and then, we have to turn the instrument off. To uh, we, uh, It's still a, a young instrument. It's been up there for, for about uh, nine months now. And it still has a little bit of water in it, and that basically condenses ice on some of the cryolinks and some of the other some of the components of the instrument. So what we do is we warm the instrument from its super cold operating temperatures back up to room temperature uh, for a few days, and then we cool it back down again. So we're, we, we're off this week. We're back on next week. Um, so, but it, it's, everything's, everything's functioning just as we expected it to. The calibration team is working to resolve a number of known artifacts, and what I mentioned before is they've got, a, they've got another known artifact they're dealing with right now. Now, in addition to things that we, we expected, and we expected this one as well, at least I did, my team was not very convinced that, that there was a problem, uh, that this was going to be a problem before we launched, but I, I knew it would be, because um, I was flying one of the Hubble Space Telescope instruments, and I knew exactly what this would happen. There's a place called the South Atlantic Anomaly. It's a place over South America, uh, which is uh, a place where the Van Allen belts get kind of pulled a little bit closer into the Earth by the Earth's magnetic field. 
And so we have all these high energy particles running around in this very, very energetic region as we pass through. And we pass through this region on every, uh, about one of every six orbits. So it basically is a part we run through every now, now and then. And when we run through that, when these high energy particles hit the spacecraft and hit the instrument, this is one of the things you have to design instruments to do, uh, it's kind of dramatic. It looks kind of like this. So that's an oxygen spectrum you're seeing there. And uh, that's what it's supposed to look like, but this is kind of what, it's, what a bunch of oxygen spectrum looked like as we're flying an orbit through the South Atlantic anomaly. Now see this stuff that looks like grass growing out of the top of our instrument, or our spectrum there? Those are cosmic rays hitting the instrument, producing ion trails as they go through. By the way, they produce ion trails and they go through you too, but they produce ion trails as they're going through our detectors. Those produce a, a string of electrons that are indistinguishable from our, to our detector from photons. Okay? And it basically registers them very nicely, and we produce this nice, noisy mess of a spectrum as we're flying through this part of the, the, uh, the orbit. Now, this is one of the most important parts of the world to monitor, because this is the Amazon up here, and we'd better be able to clean these spectra up and make them look usable as we're going through that region. Otherwise, this is going to be a big problem. And meanwhile, we have this detector, which is one of the most sensitive cosmic ray detectors ever launched by NASA, and that's not what it's supposed to be there for. So we had to clean this up. We came up with a very quick algorithm to fix this problem. It literally took us a week to get it implemented, uh, and it's working beautifully. So that problem's been completely solved. But that's the kind of thing that we're, we're up against with our calibration. In addition to that, we now have a retrieval algorithm. I told you that spacecraft is only collecting spectra. They're basically taking the sunlight, dividing it into a rainbow of colors, sending those, those, those little rainbows back to us on Earth. And then we have to figure out what does that mean for CO2. And we run that through a retrieval algorithm that includes something called a forward radiative transfer model. This basically is a model that, that takes input, including a guess for what the atmosphere looks like, some information about how molecules absorb, you know, what is the, what is the effective absorption cross-section of a given molecule of CO2 or oxygen. We know those things very accurately from the laboratory. What aerosol scatter like, or clouds and stuff, how, how the sky scatters. We also need to know what the observing geometry of the system is. What angle was I looking down at the Earth? What angle is the sun coming in? I give that information to a radiative transfer model, very similar to the one, but much better than most of the ones used in climate models to predict CO2 global warming. This is just a, a very accurate radiative transfer model. And we use that to predict a spectrum based on this input. And so it very nicely produces beautiful high resolution spectra. We can evolve that with an instrument model that, that says how the instrument samples that spectra. And it produces a synthetic spectrum that then I can go and compare to the spectrum recorded by the spacecraft. And it either has, either these individual little absorption lines are too deep or not deep enough. Based on that information, the inverse model now then uses that and some other information to, and the difference between the spectra, in order to adjust the original atmosphere, change the CO2 amount, change the temperature, change water vapor, change aerosols, whatever it has to do, it'll make those changes, and then we'll run it back through the forward model. And we keep doing that until the synthetic spectrum looks just like the real spectrum. And then we say, you know, I think we maybe got it right. We probably have the right distribution of carbon dioxide, temperature, aerosols, uh, all the other variables. We actually measure 60-some-odd uh, variables in every one of the spectra. So this is a process we've been going through. And as we go through that process, we eventually generate uh, measurements of carbon dioxide or maps of carbon dioxide. These are maps from the GOSAT spacecraft. Our team has been using this algorithm to analyze data from the Japanese greenhouse gases observing satellite GOSAT for the last six years. They, when our satellite fell in the ocean, theirs launched perfectly. They came and adopted our team. They said, come work with us. You've got some nice, useful tools. You can work with our team. We were generating spectra. They generated, we, this was an independent product. They generated one product, and there are about four or five teams around the world that have been independently analyzing these data and learning how to do this very complicated process better and better and better. Still not perfect, but we're getting there. We've really learned a lot in the last six years. So the GOSAT data was a critical uh, uh, validation activity for us, though. We, we didn't know how much we didn't know until we used the GOSAT data. But now we're using all of these methods on OCO2, and we've been able to accomplish more in nine months than we were able to accomplish in six years with GOSAT, but not as much as we want to accomplish. So let's see what it looks like. So most of the time, OCO2 flies around the world now. This is what it does, it's looking down, straight down underneath the spacecraft, recording uh, spectra over a very narrow ground track as we fly around the world, 
Okay? And what this is kind of illustrating is different amounts of CO2 are seen along that path as we fly along. This is called nadir mode. It works absolutely beautifully over land. And because you're looking straight down, if there's a cloud, you basically can miss the clouds occasionally and get some decent data, even in partially cloudy scenes. So over land, this is the best way to look. But actually, if we had just gone a little bit further and gone over Lake, near, uh, or Lake Superior there, all the lights would have gone out. Water is almost black, almost no reflection at the wavelengths we're measuring CO2. So for the colors of light that, that we need to measure CO2, which are out in the infrared, water is just black. So this doesn't work so well. So we miss, we only get land when we're looking straight down. But we get nice data, and it looks like this. This is a, just a quick map from last week that I pulled down just after we started producing data. And what we've done here is take all of the data in two by two degree boxes, and it's averaged it all together. And just a quick average, this is not meant to be a quality scientific product. This is meant to be a, uh, is the thing returning data, does it look kind of okay? You know, this is just a, a, a uh, browse map just to see if the data is coming in right. But what you see are things that you kind of expect. Uh, there's this bright red area over China. That's because China's basically got a very high CO2 amount uh, pretty much uh, during this entire period. This is for December, it turns out. Uh, the other thing you notice, you see a little bit of enhancement over the east, eastern seaboard of the U.S. Once again, this is mainly Tennessee Valley Authority CO2 coming off the eastern seaboard. So this very bright uh, uh, distribution along the Sahel in Africa. That was surprising. It was so surprising when I first saw it. I didn't actually see it here. I saw it down here a month earlier in some of the October data. And it surprised me so much, I went back and looked at that MODIS data from the other instrument that's flying right behind us uh, in formation. And they're burning the whole damn place down. There are fires everywhere. I've never seen so many fires. I, I never looked at MODIS data before, but I mean, it's like, my gosh, there's a lot of fires there. And then for December, the, the fire, the burning season had moved from South Africa up to the Sahel. And they, there's just everywhere you look, there's a fire burning. Okay, you saw those in the map we had before. You saw that pulsing fire there. Well, we're seeing that very nicely. Seeing a little bit of that in the Amazon, but this is already moving into the wet season here, so you know, it's, we're be beginning to, to lose that, and unfortunately, lots of clouds. That's a pretty now, the other thing you'll notice when you look at this map is you see no data very far north. We have very few points in Canada, very few points in Russia, uh, very few points in Northern Europe, none in England, it turns out, in, in any place in the UK. And that's because it was cloudy. And our cloud screening algorithms are just a little bit too aggressive right now, and they're throwing away a lot more data than they really should be. So we're working on that, but um, it'll take a little while to get, get them tuned so that they keep a little bit more of the data. So, um, but yeah, uh, other seasons, like right now, if you go look at the, the maps were produced over the last month, they extend quite a bit further north. Uh, the other problem, of course, is that at some point, there's no sunlight up there. So it's going to be impossible. This, this requires reflected sunlight to work. So it's not going to be a, a complete answer. Now, I mentioned that we don't get very good data over the oceans, and you saw no CO2, no CO2 data over the oceans in that map. To get data over the, for CO2 over the oceans, what we do is look at something called the glint spot. This is the bright ocean glint, the reflection off the ocean. And so you see this bright region over here. That turns out being super bright at the wavelengths we're looking. So what we have to do is actually, you notice the spacecraft actually points the instrument on this, and it only moves about as fast as the second hand on your, on your watch. So you can't jump from nadir to glint as you go from land to ocean. So we just put the set satellite into glint mode, and it maps up the whole Earth in glint mode. Then we put it back in nadir mode, we map up the whole Earth in nadir mode, and we alternate between those modes. Okay? So when we do that, we get results that look like this. Now, this is just showing the glint measurements over the ocean. We get glint measurements over the land. They look just like these. But once again, you see a very nice distribution, very good coverage of the oceans in this mode. When you put these together, which I think I did, yes, that's what it looks like. So this is basically what a, a month of carbon dioxide data from OCO2 looks like for one of our very, the very first month we ever tried to process. Not the best work we'll ever do. There's probably some ratty data in there. I probably could not swear to the values anywhere on this map as being correct for any given box. But in general, this looks just like every other piece of data we have. It's consistent. It's got, it, it, this is the right planet, right? This isn't Venus. It's not Mars. It's, it's the Earth. It should look like this. And so I wouldn't, even though I can't, I can't defend every point on this, I have some confidence that, in general, they're giving me the right answers. We're still working on a lot of the final calibration on the system. 
Now, in addition to those, and the reason I say the data is pretty good, we have a third mode called target observation. So we can interrupt our nadir or glint measurements every now and then, move the satellite over, and stare at an isolated target on the surface of the Earth. And in this particular little simulation, what we're doing is staring at a target that's in my backyard, uh, which is actually Caltech. We're actually going to be looking at Pasadena, California as we fly over. And as we do that, we're going to take about 12,000 measurements over a single site on Earth, over a whole range of viewing angles. And why are we going to do that? We're going to do that because at places like Caltech, nope, that didn't, we actually, that's actually supposed to start on its own, but let's see if it, what we do is we paint up an area on, this, on the surface of the Earth when we're doing that. And this is a place where we have one of our calibration stations, our ground-based up-looking Fourier transform spectrometers that I mentioned, these things called TECON stations. We have 22 of those things around the world right now, and we've got one of them sitting right at, on, a, on top of a building at Caltech. And as we fly over, we can take all of these measurements. We know what the accuracy of the measurements from that station are. They're really very precise, fraction of a part per million uh, precise. So we then can compare the OCO2 measurements that you see shown there uh, as we're flying over. Uh, in an in a overflight we did back in, I think this is October, um, and we basically get, we can make that comparison and learn a lot about the accuracy of the data. And how does it look? It's not looking too bad, actually. It's looking kind of like this. When we paint up Los Angeles, we get a distribution with carbon dioxide amounts around 402 parts per million in that particular time. This was October. The next day, we overflew Edwards Air Force Base, which has another one of these spectrometers integrated into a shipping container. The one at Caltech is a little bit nicer, accommodated a little bit more nicely. Uh, but the one out at Edwards Air Force Base is sitting in a shipping container. We took measurements there. We're only seeing way down here at about 395, 396 parts per million. This is as big a difference as we ever see between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. That's a tremendous difference. But we're seeing it over a distance of about 60 kilometers between a heavily industrialized, pol very polluted place, second most polluted city in the U.S., my home, and uh, <laughs> a place just a little bit further north where we're getting this fresh air coming off the ocean. The ocean's been working on that air as it comes over, right? So we've got a much lower CO2 amount during this particular season there. But what we've been able to do is compare the OCO measurements with the measurements from these stations. And even though we have this very big difference, the satellite does a very good job of tracking those kinds of differences down to a very high level of precision. Okay? So it's doing pretty well early in the mission. It'll do better later. So if we make comparisons, we, I mentioned we have those sites where we make those validation measurements distributed around the world. We have 22 sites. This is a, a small ensemble that we took during a very short period of time. Caltech, Edwards Air Force Base, those are the ones you just saw. Cal Karlsruhe, Germany, Lamont, Oklahoma, uh, Lauder, New Zealand, and Scuba, Japan. Okay, so nice distribution of sites around the northern and the southern hemisphere. Uh, tropics as, as well as, uh, no, I guess we don't have a Darwin in there, do we? Uh, but what we were doing is just looking at the relationship of the uh, TECON measurements along this axis, the OCO2 retrievals along this axis, and they're looking pretty good. Bias is low. We're getting pretty good results there. And, but the standard deviations are a little bit high. And that surprised us and maybe alarmed us a little bit because the algorithm was telling us that the actual precision is half a part per million, so about as width, width of my finger here. So we're wondering why these error bars were so big. And then we started looking at the data a little bit harder and we got the answer. We actually have a, a, a little tiny bias here, but what we're really finding is that there are some biases in the data. What we found, I noticed that we had, I minute, mentioned earlier, there are eight cross-track footprints. So every time we make a measurement or a snapshot, we actually measure eight different places on the Earth that are adjacent to each other over about a 10 kilometer wide swath. We found out the results on the left side of the swath are always giving us lower hours values than those on the right by about one part per million. There's a little calibration problem we've identified. It turns out it's associated with, on the detectors that we use, some of the pixels have gone, black, gone bad over time. And those bad pixels are corrupting the results and producing this gradient that you're seeing. We're fixing that problem by sending up new maps to the spacecraft of where we know the bad pixels to be. We actually make pictures, our images of the sun and of lamps to, to track these over time. And as we do this, we manage to, to reduce the slope of this by a factor of two so far. We need to do that a few more factors of two to get it to the level we really need it. But that's a major bias. That's the major bias in the system right now, calibration error. It'll give us another few months and we'll get that fixed. It really takes some time to do this, by the way. 
Meanwhile, there's some other issues. We found out that there's a surface pressure bias. We saw this with GOSAT. We've seen it with TCON stations. If you get the surface pressure wrong, if you retrieve the wrong surface pressure, you retrieve the wrong CO2 amount in a very systematic way. And we know exactly why that is. It turns out this value we're getting is essentially equal to number of CO2 molecules divided by surface pressure. <laughs> so if you get the surface pressure wrong, you'll get a compensating error in the CO2. And so we have this nice uh, characteristic uh, uh, variation. And this is actually, we know we're getting the surface pressure wrong uh, because we're using, in this particular case, uh, pressure measurements made from the stations, those, those TCON stations. We have, temp we have pressure sensors in them. But also, uh, ECMWF, uh, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting over in Reading, makes very nice uh, pressure measurements, not good enough for our use, but they make global measurements. And we compare our measurements to their measurements in a kind of a, a regional scale. Their measurements are good enough, and our me measurements should agree with theirs on regional scales. And they don't. We, we basically are getting errors on the order of a couple of hectopascals, a couple of parts per thousand in pressure. And that's sending our CO2 off. We can see those errors. We can correct them. Uh, but uh, that's an area that's going to take a little bit more work. We know why the errors are there. They're, they have to do with uncertainties in the spectroscopy of oxygen. This little diatomic molecule that we breathe. You would think spectroscopists, after 100 years, could figure out a molecule that just does this. That's all oxygen does. It vibrates in one way at one set of energies. But it does another thing that's a little weird. It does this. And it's, a, it's got a spin, so this produces a magnetic dipole transition. That's the band we're looking at. It's a magnetic dipole transition. Spectroscopists are still struggling with it. We had to actually invent two new methods for doing spectroscopic measurements to get, CO, get oxygen into the range of utility for this mission. We've had to revolutionize atmospheric spectroscopy. So I've, we have a big team, Caltech, National Institute for Standards and Technology, France, Grenoble, you know, all of these places around the world. And we're using their, their data and these new techniques to refine this. And we'll get this, this, we'll get this solved. Probably end of summer, we'll see the first big help in this area. Oh, that wasn't supposed to come up quite then, but uh, let's just go there. Now, as we're flying around the world, we've also been seeing some rather interesting things. And this, these are just being presented as rather interesting things right now. We really haven't validated any of this data yet. But as we're flying over Qatar, you can see if, if, you, if you've got good eyesight, it looks better on, this, on screens usually, you, the little green lines through here, those are our swaths as we're flying over Qatar. There's three different swaths on three different days. Uh, the, 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 the third, the tw 19th and the 20th, or 19th, uh, the third of, of uh, October, the 19th of October and the 20th of, of November. We had three glint tracks, it turns out, going over Qatar. But as we went over the port refinery here, we saw some enhanced CO2. That's not really surprising. Flew over Doha City, we saw some enhanced CO2. Wasn't really surprising. We kind of expected to be able to detect CO2 over these kinds of small isolated point sources. When we fly over London, and we do, uh, we see significant enhancements in CO2 here occasionally. But where we saw the biggest enhancement we've ever seen to date is when we're flying over the Gillette coal field in Gillette, Wyoming. This is a, the, the world's probably largest open pit coal mine. It produces like 15% of all the coal used in the US. And we know that coal mines emit methane. A lot of people know that. This is the canary in the coal mine. That's why you bring it there. You have these deadly gases that kill it. Most of it's methane. They also emit CO2 in almost equal proportions. So what we're seeing as we flew over is, uh, this is one of our tracks, and red is about 405, 406 parts per million, and blue, which is background, is about 385 parts per million. This is an enormous enhancement in the local carbon dioxide from this one source. This isn't burning coal. This is just mining it. Okay? So we see some very big enhancements. Now, meanwhile, GOSAT took some measurements that were just upwind. They didn't know that what upwind was. They didn't know which way the wind was blowing, but they just happened to take this nice track of data, and they're seeing regularly about 395 parts per million all the way up. So kind of in between. Meanwhile, OCO2 is taking its measurements. One of the things that OCO2 brings to the table, GOSAT makes a very small number of measurements every day. OCO2 makes a lot. 
So one of the things this allows us to do is to pick, get, pick up these kinds of things. Also, the OCO2 measurements, they're far more sensitive than the COSAT measurements. Each one of these little tiny squares here is about three times as sensitive as, as that larger footprint. Okay, so we're, it's, we're a little late to the party, but we are still bringing some useful things. And we are seeing some variations that are interesting. And as time goes on, the person who's actually doing these measurements uh, is actually interested in volcanoes. He's looking for quiescent emissions from volcanoes. And so that's what he's actually developed the software to do. It's, it's kind of neat. He's making progress. Now, another little measurement we're making that we didn't intend to make when we started making, when we built this instrument initially, uh, but what we found out was the oxygen A band, that, that band that we use to measure oxygen, is uh, if you look in the Fraunhofer, solar Fraunhofer lines in that band, we actually can detect the fluorescence by plants. When plants are actually uh, performing photosynthesis, about 1 to 2 percent of the energy they receive from the sun is then re-rated, radiated, so they, they receive blue radiation and red radiation, and they emit the radiation in slightly longer wavelengths. That's fluorescence. They literally glow. Okay? It's a very hard measurement to make, but it turns out our spectrometer does a really good job of it for the first time, and so when we're flying over the Earth, it turns out this is an easier measurement to make than CO2 by far. So as we saw in August, see how bright the corn belt is here? That's really radiating a lot, Photosyn a lot of photosynthesis going on there during that season. But as the season progresses, it just turns off. If you go and look at the, the tropics of the Amazon here, you'll see it also glowing sometimes more than others. Now, this is very similar to the kind of measurements we make from other satellites where we just look for how green the world is. And so, you know, not how green is my valley, it's how green is my planet. Uh, so you're flying over and you basically use greenness to monitor the area, the, the, the amount of photosynthesis going on in plants. The trouble is if you take a plant and you clip it, basically it stops doing photosynthesis within about an hour and stops fluorescing. But it's green for weeks. So places like the Amazon in particular, we never know the trees are dying until they've been dead for months. So it's been very, very hard to monitor the CO2 uptake by plants around the world using just greenness because it's just not a very fast acting uh, measure. Okay? So chlorophyll fluorescence, this new measurement we're making, is a little faster. And we're hoping that it'll give some new insight. But this is a brand new variable. And I think it's fair to say nobody really knows what it's telling us right now. I think it's telling us something about where the photosynthesis is more intense. But I don't really think it's telling us a quantitatively, my opinion, I don't think it's giving us a quantitative measurement of photosynthesis yet. Give us a little while. We'll figure it out. But right now, it's just a neat variable. And it's really giving, giving us a lot of new information. That's exactly the kind of information we need, along with the CO2 information. Not only are we seeing where human activities and natural sources are emitting CO2 in the atmosphere, we are actually getting another kind of spatial map for where it should be getting absorbed by plant land plants. We can put this into our models, like the one I showed you earlier, and actually see if it improves their, their performance in uh, telling us where the sources and the sinks are. So, Product delivery. I used to show little pictures of, of you know, spectra or something and put dates on them and say, I'm going to deliver a product in the future. Instead, what I'm doing here is um, I'm actually showing you the products. If you go to the, this website, you can start downloading our products today. Uh, the Level 1B product, these are the actual spectra that we collect. Every spectra we collect ends up in this archive within a couple of days of the time we collect it. And the whole world, can anybody with a computer can downlink it. The, 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 the actual... Uh, Files come up in HDF5. This is an online or a, a freebie uh, HDF5 reader, uh, and it just shows you what the what the actual uh, folders in the file are. For you get one file for every orbit, and you can go and download those if you want to actually play the game of, of retrieving CO2 from the data and, and seeing if it looks like ours. Or if you just want the CO2 data itself, you get these files, which are the level two data sets, and that you can use those to generate nice maps of CO2 and chlorophyll fluorescence and surface pressure if you want, because we measure that quantity. Then, as time goes on over the next few weeks and months, our team is going to be developing mapped products where we take this data, which is just those individual points along the track, and map them into maps to generate more sophisticated maps. Also, uh, to actually use the data in something called flux inversion models, to actually retrieve the sources and sinks, the locations and the intensities of the fluxes of CO2 through the surface of the Earth on spatial scales, kind of like what's shown in this tiny little map on the right here, so at least regional scales. 
So we'll see northeastern U.S., we'll be able to see the Amazon, we'll see uh, Congo, we'll see Sahel and all of that. We'll see those things on those kinds of scales, you know, a few degrees by few degrees latitude. We'll understand where the CO2 is being absorbed and where it's being emitted. We think this will be a real revolution in our understanding for how this system works. So the data is going out there now. These two products are now going in in production mode. We'll generate these as fast as we can. Uh, and our users are actually generating for us as well right now. So things are going pretty well, and we're, we're at least generating a product. It's not the product I want to deliver. Uh, it's not the best product we'll ever deliver, but it's the first product. Over time, it'll improve. So give us a few more weeks or months, and we'll get it, get it into better stead. So um, we're in orbit. The satellite is, uh, is working nominally. The instrument's off this week. It'll be back on next week, and we'll be back in service. We've been generating products and delivering them to this organization called the Goddard Earth Science Data and Information Services Center. Uh, you can basically just uh, Google GES disk and it'll send you right there and you'll, you'll be able to download data for dis distribution to the entire world. Uh, by the way, uh, we started delivering our first CO2 products on March 30th, as it mentioned on the previous slide. And by April 1st, we had 4,000 downloads, half from China. Always, good, always glad to help. So, but have the rest of the world, including many places around UK, are downloading data. Paul Palmer up in Edinburgh is down. Edinburgh is downloaded every all of the data. Um, Hartman Bosch has not. He's at Leicester, but he's a member of the team. He's supposed to download it. He promises. Uh, we're getting there. Uh, we're validating these data against TCON, and we're learning where our biases are, and we're improving the product. We really needed this, 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 this calculation, by the way, that we're doing to generate the CO2 from these data is very expensive. We have a room full of computers. We basically, the 30th of March, we said go. We're getting the biggest volume of data we've ever seen before. We've generated more data since that time than we generated during the entire six years of GoSat, and we're seeing it for the first time ourselves. So as time goes on, the product will improve as we identify glitches and problems and start to correct them. Uh, we've updated our documentation. So you, if you go to this site, it also tells you what the products are, what they mean, how to read them, how to use them, and how to get in touch with us when you find the problems. <laughs> Please do. And so uh, once again, this is the site where the data can be obtained. So in summary, uh, we really do need to make space-based measurements of carbon dioxide if we ever want to really understand the system. It, it, I, these measurements will never replace the incredibly important ground-based and aircraft-based measurements that are made by all of our colleagues in NOAA, NSF, across the world, uh, all of the U.S., uh, all the uh, international partners that are making these measurements. But they're also a critical new tool in the box to give you the coverage, the resolution, and the sensitivity you need over the whole globe. The biggest challenge we're facing is that in order to make a useful measurement, it has to have an accuracy better than 0.25%. That's kind of, if it's not that good, it's no good. And this has been a continual challenge with GOSAT. It'll be a challenge with OCO2 for the next year or two. So things will improve. OCO2 is not the last CO2 mission. It's our first effort. But it's a useful tool in the box to try to solve this incredibly complicated problem. As time goes on, we'll need better satellites, we'll need better ground-based measurements, we'll need better measurements in the atmosphere from aircraft in order to actually solve this problem. But we think that we've brought you a new technology that will be extremely useful and will help us get to the next step. So with that, thank you very much. It will get worse with time, but very, very, very slowly. These detectors were built back in 2005 and are flight spares from the OCO mission. They're very, very old. Also, we discovered, unfortunately, very much to our chagrin, after we'd already buttoned up the instrument and shipped it to orbital to be in, installed in the spacecraft, that the folks building the Hubble Space Telescope instruments with the same detectors in them had discovered that if you leave these detectors at around room temperature, they slowly rip themselves to shreds. We had our instrument in a box, <laughs> stored for years. And uh, if we had known that, we would have kept things cold. But we didn't know that. So 
basically most of the damage was done while we were waiting for our launch vehicle to be built. And so um, we anticipate slow changes every time we cycle the system from up to room temperature to do de a decontamination cycle. We have a few more bad pixels, but it's just a few, a handful, and there are a million pixels on those detectors. So um, we have to track it, but it's not going to get bad fast. This will not be the thing that ends the mission. There are so many other things that, that are more likely to be the, the issue. Okay. Yes? Uh, right, the basis of your method is you take the ratio from an oxygen to a CO2. So I can't see why it depends on the height of the uh, reflecting surface. I mean, it might be cloud, it might be ground. Do you need to know the albedo and that sort of thing? It, it actually turns out we, we do need to know the surface pressure very accurately to get this calculation correct because just for a variety of reasons, uh, molecules, the, the cross-section of a molecule, the amount of uh, those spectral lines are broadened depends on temp pressure, for example. So we do need, re need to retrieve surface pressure. We also are, uh, as you say, if we get a, an oxygen measurement and a CO2 measurement that are perfectly boresighted and we can actually take the ratio of those two, that takes out like 99% of the errors. We need to only take out another factor of 10 by doing a very good retrieval of aerosols, uh, everything else in the system. So if you're looking at the cloud top, do you need to know the pressure there? Uh, or, or the, that's the problem with the cloud. Is it, it's We're, bright, some of my colleagues are actually trying to make measurements over the tops of clouds. Uh, they're not as useful as measurements all the way to the surface because all the action is happening down here on the ground. Yeah. But, but, you know, once again, uh, over places like Germany in the winter, just as an example, or Britain in the winter, it's always cloudy. And if you look at the clouds from above, which I unfortunately do flying on airplanes too much, they're very large and flat. And so in the future, you're probably going to see a product taken above clouds. Uh, two of my team members, maybe three of them, are competing to make that product right now. Right now, the error bars are pretty big. They're about between a half a percent and one percent. And if we can get that down to around a quarter of a percent, that becomes a useful product. In fact, if you have a partly cloudy region then, then one can actually get some profile information about CO2 by getting the cloud free in the clouds and the cloud free in the clouds. And everybody's really excited about that kind of information. The AIRS instrument team and us are working together very closely now. AIRS is an instrument that measures water vapor uh, and, and uh, temperature primarily as its primary variables. It's much more of a climate instrument than we are. And those guys are flying literally right behind us, uh, 400 seconds behind us in orbit. And so uh, they're, they're actually making measurements and now saying, what happens if we take the OCO2 CO2 amounts and the amounts they, they calculate in the middle, tro middle troposphere themselves and we put those into the, into the calculations? Does it change the amount of radiation we see along the path? And it does, but the amounts are tiny, tiny differences as we're seeing flying along. The year-to-year the -year variation is much bigger. Uh, the month-to-month -month variation uh, is, is a much bigger impact on this. It turns out, let me give you an example. A, 0.15 degree Kelvin temperature change gives you the same change in the radiation out of the top of the atmosphere as one ppm in CO2. Uh, one ppm, one part per million wow. CO2, is basically the same change as as uh, 0.15 degrees Kelvin, or C, measured. Yes. So if you make a measurement, if I if I'm if my temperature is if I change my temperature by uh, 0.15 degrees C. It, it will change the radiation at the top of the atmosphere just as much as if I change the CO2 column uh, by one part per million. So people on climate change, which I mean, this is strongly evidential. Yes. Yeah. Actually, a very interesting study was published uh, just this month uh, where somebody took an area instrument and looked up and we looked down at it at the same time with Chris as they were flying over. And they did a radiation closure experiment, actually accounting for all of the photons. And sure enough, it works just absolutely beautifully. You can measure the greenhouse effect to this kind of accuracy, to a quarter of a percent accuracy, from measure instruments we have on the ground and the instruments we have in space right now. There is no doubt that this works this way. So, uh, like I said, friends of mine are making that measurement now and publishing it. And just uh, when, they, when, it, when the publication came out, <laughs> I'm reading it and I'm going, 
No, duh, of course it works this way. <laughs> this isn't science. But it turned out making a big storm in the press because nobody had actually just kind of done it before. <laughs> It wasn't exactly a surprise. Question back here. Yes. We make aerosol measurements. Yeah, we make aerosol measurements. The instrument, the oxygen A band in particular, was originally supposed to fly on CloudSat and then Calypso. It was descaled from both of those aerosol and cloud missions due to cost. I was the person who built the one for the CloudSat instrument. In fact, the A-band on this is a, has direct heritage back to that aerosol instrument. So we actually have a very, very sensitive aerosol detector with the oxygen A-band. And also that two micron channel is there also primarily to measure aerosols. I have two different CO2 bands I'm trying to actually use, and they measure CO2 in completely different ways. One of them is very weak and has about a linear dependence on the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. One of them is super strong. The individual lines are, are very almost completely saturated, and it has an almost square root dependence on the, on the CO2 amount in the atmosphere. But it is so super sensitive to aerosols, just like the oxygen A-band is. So if you think of the oxygen A-band, and you take those, those strong lines, and you say, where in the atmosphere do you hit optical depth unity? Okay. Well, the, with this spectrometer, with its resolving power around 20,000, uh, I hit the tropopause with optical depth unity and the strongest lines. Next strongest lines a little bit further down. Next strongest lines a little further down. So I do a very good aerosol retrieval. Or I, I like it to be a very good aerosol retrieval. It's not working so well right now. And so what I'm doing is this morning and yesterday, I'm, I've been fighting with my team to line up with the Calypso spacecraft, which is right behind us, about 10 minutes. And so in the orbit, about 600 seconds behind us. And what we're going to try to do, right now we're, we're kind of flying along the same orbit track, but we're kind of oscillating relative to each other. And I'm trying to get our team to kind of start coordinating with them so, we're, so that we're in a dance and we actually see exactly the same track as this aerosol instrument right behind us. Our, our, our algorithm will get better very, very soon. So we're basically using every technique we can. We use airs, we use MODIS, we use, we use Calypso, we use CloudSat, and we try to refine our aerosol uh, results uh, and make them look a little bit better over time. Right now, my correlation coefficient with Aeronet is 0.4, which stinks. So, but, you know, once again, we're, we're doing the best we can. And this is a major area of interest and in, in effort in the team. I would say a third of my entire algorithm team, uh, half a dozen people, are working just on this problem. If we can't get the aerosols right, we're not going to get the CO2 right. Because you mentioned this thing about oxygen, ratioing oxygen. The trouble is that aerosols scatter a little differently in the oxygen band than the CO2 bands. So what we need to do is actually simulate the actual aerosol distribution very accurately so that I can extrapolate from the, the, where the oxygen band's absorbing to where the CO2 bands are absorbing or actually interpolate between the two micron and A band. That works pretty well so far, not, not well enough. It's a major source of error. So maybe we'll stop there and if there's any questions. Informally, yeah. I can ask. Any ones that are there. We use basically an, a, we use a suite of aerosols from a climatology uh, that we, we bring up. We use the Mera climatology that Goddard generates right now, which assimilates all the data from MODIS and MISER and all of those things. It generates a climatology. We use that climatology as a prior and also to tell us what types of aerosol are most prevalent in an area. Then the model always uses at least the two major types of aerosol plus uh, ice cloud plus water cloud. So we always have, even in cloud-free regions, we have a few ice cloud particles, a few water cloud particles floating around up there. So we use a mixture of four different aerosol types in every retrieval that we do.